Dr. Dr. Tegani, I'm very happy that you found your time. Unfortunately, we are witnessing the new escalation of uh, already super escalated uh, situation in the Levant. Only for for people who randomly follow news from this region, the conflict started uh, on on October seventh. Unfortunately, we had the series of uh, of terror attacks series of counter-terror attacks in the last uh, year or year and a half, especially when Netanyahu was re-elected. And uh, it seems that many analysts are ignoring the root cause of the problem. And in our initial conversation, we are going to tackle the, the settler colonialism that you started for decades probably so please uh, go. Uh, it has now become a decade yes yeah. where do you want to start we are going to start with the settler colonialism because this is the the root cause of the problem in in our region or the problem between uh, Israel and its neighbors and Israel. I'll start I'll start yeah I'll start by saying that it's definitely the root cause of the problem yeah. but by the end of this interview if I get uh, if I manage to convey my thoughts coherently which is not a guarantee um we will find out that it's also the solution yeah that settler colonialism is the solution but starting with the problem Let's let's get a few um, let's get a few excuse me um, definitions and um, uh, let's let's focus on some of the concepts that are floating around. Um, I would say first thing that we need to avoid is um, the idea. Two very important concepts that exist in this theory is a settler and native or indigenous. These are important. Um, these are important concepts that animate the theory or the history that uses this theory or analytical framework would be a better way to say it's an analytical framework. But when I use the term indigenous or native and settler. It is not a concept that conveys some sort of judgment and moral assertion that a person belongs to a piece of land and a person does not belong to a piece of land. So if we look at Palestine or Eretz Israel, if we, if we uh, uh, turn over the stones, we will not find property of the Palestinian people, and we will not find property of the Jewish people. Um, each side in this conflict between Jews and Palestinians uh, have uh, uh, have a historical truth to back up their. Um, uh, claims. So you will find ancient synagogues. You will find um, testaments to uh, Jewish even sovereignty and uh, and uh, political organization. You will also not be able to find um, the notion that there was a complete exile in the earliest uh, um, uh, Roman times of the local population and um, complete transferal of other peoples from the Middle East. So in that sense, Palestinians can rightly claim, and Zionists were very aware of that, that they are descendants of those ancient Hebrews as well. 
Uh, and so there is very little um, uh, contribution that this academic way of understanding history can give to the fundamental question of who the land belongs to. In a sense, real estate disputes between people are never resolved in academic hallways. They're resolved in the battlefield, usually. Um, so this is not about giving an academic um, stamp on a national political claim. It's just not about that. So let's put that on the side. No one, if someone comes out of this conversation thinking, I think Jews are the rightful owners or the Palestinians are the rightful owners of the land, I've, I didn't do a good job. So let's put that on the side. Um, having made that clear, it's uh, settler colonialism is a way to understand the fundamental problem that, uh, or, or to characterize the relationship Zionists and Palestinians have. And in order, and when, and I think the, the best example of a very early use of this uh, paradigm, again, analytical framework, one of the earlier, earliest and best uses I don't think it, it's, it's been matched since, was done by Zev Jabutinsky. Not a very pro-Palestinian character. Of course. Yes. Yeah, and uh, if, for the non-experts in the Israel-Palestine issues, uh, this is the father of right-wing Zionism. Or reform um, Zionism, how, how he used to call it. Revisionist. Oh, revisions, yes, yes, yes. Revisions, right. Zionism. You're but right. also, but also, Netanyahu would claim that he is the intellectual and political descendant of uh, Jabotinsky. But he, he's uh, his father was the private secretary of uh, Jabotinsky. Right. Mirikovsky, Benzon Mirikovsky. I right. mean, I, many times I call Netanyahu Mirikovsky because it makes more sense. But this is another that, topic. That uh, you know, again. Let's not, so, so this is not about celebrating the foreign, uh, uh, the, the foreign beginnings of some of Israel's elites. This isn't, so th I mean, you can, you're free to do that, but it's not, this is maybe not. Later, uh, maybe later on, I'm going to, to comment on their European origin, because originally they were Europeans, all of them. If we are talking about founding fathers of uh, Zionism, they come from Ashkenazim. Yes, but what is what is so? But is there is there Europeanism essential to probably, who they are? No, probably in their case because they were culturally, linguistically part of uh, European fabric of societies. And you know what? You know what? Let's take that. Uh, let's take that. Um, the Hebrewization. Yeah. Of names. Let's let's put a pin on that, and I I will show how that fact, that historical fact, mm -hmm. fits in with a settler colonial. Yeah. Framework. Please go ahead. So well, the floor is yours. Uh, so so going back, um, Jabutinsky was not um, in the business of delegitimizing Zionism. Was not in the business of. Um, uh, bolstering uh, the Palestinian uh, national claim to the land. He was about to understand objectively, scientifically, level-headedly, right? Let's not yeah. get our emotions and our convictions. What is the central problem that Zionists have, right? And the central problem is is that they want to make Palestine their home, their national home, and there is already a people there that considers 
Palestine or Eretz Israel to be their national. That's it. It's very simple. But uh, it is, a, I think, an objective uh, uh, depiction of reality in 1923. And keep in mind, Jabotinsky writes, na- writes about the Palestinian Arabs. Of course. Meaning... Meaning Arabs that are that what makes them distinct Absolutely. is their. This is what so, I wanted to mention because so, people who people who live like yourself three or four generations in uh, in Palestine or Israel are also Palestinians. No, nobody can refer to individuals who are third or fourth generation there as. Uh, but he, but he's not even saying. But he's. Not, but he's going a step further. He's not saying as individuals there are Palestinians. Yeah. He points out that for them, Palestine is a national center. Okay. He, he in it's not written, it's not the first thing that's written, but even in that text in 1923, yeah. we're talking about after the 1920 and 21 uprisings already, mm-hmm. right? So he already points out that the Palestinian, that the Arabs, that okay. reside in this area have developed some sort of national consciousness that is connected to that area. And he to makes the extent. argument. I, I disagree that, with that, but of course, it no, was, but, uh, his idea. Uh, so, so, so he's uh, uh, right now, you can't deny that that's the fact. Right now, you can't deny that, uh, that a Palestinian from Hebron or Khalil yeah. and uh, Nablus and Gaza have a sense of what Palestine is and it's part of their national imagination. Right now you can't deny that that's a fact, right? Okay, some people are delusional and they believe in all kinds of uh, concepts, but historically they came from different parts of uh, of uh, of the Middle East. Uh, I see, and I you see can find the relatives. To, I see that now I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be the Palestinian and you're going to have Advocate, to be the Zionist. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, I consider them Arabs Arabs from Palestine, and uh, they have their relatives in Jordan or in Syria. Historically, but, the whole area for a long time was a part of Greater Syria. But he, but in the same manner, historically, that area became detached from the from from the rest of the Middle East, and because of that historically concrete fact that Palestine was somehow separated from Egypt, from uh, uh, the uh, Lebanon Jordan. and Syria, and yeah. eventually from the eastern bank of the Jordan, yeah, Jordan, has created facts. It's a so and so. Jabotinsky was not was arguing against the notion that an Arab living inside Palestine is exactly like an Arab living in Baghdad and Damascus. That's exactly what he said, mm-hmm. right? So he understood already that the national consciousness that the arising national consciousness of the people in the same land that Zion is coveted is bound to that land. Not, mm-hmm. It's not um, um, uh, easily uh, replaceable with other Arab lands. And mm-hmm. that is the fundamental Zionist problem. And that is, you could say, the root of the conflict. And that kind of antagonism, differing interests, um, differing motivations is the settler colonial situation. You have one you have one population that covets a land that that's not under its control, not politically, not demographically. The majority of the people, or I mean the the Consolidation of this movement depends on a mass movement of people from outside that area into that area. Yet at the same time, in that area, there are already people who are not very pleased with this plan. That is the central problem. It that is a problem. Yeah, that is, the, the, that, is, yeah. that is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a nutshell. I don't see... Judaism versus Islam to be no. the main cause here. No, it's not. Not East versus West or anything like that. It is 
a very historically identifiable mm, political movement in the late 19th century to reach another part of the world, Jews to reach another, and this was not colonial conquest. They were not doing this in the name of a foreign nation, of, yeah. of Poland. Or metropolis. Yeah. But they were also not coming as immigrants. There were Jews in Palestine already. Oh, they yeah. were not coming to join seamlessly that group of Jews that was already there and was incorporated in the Ottoman order. They wanted to create a different order. That doesn't mean a Jewish state. That doesn't mean two states. It doesn't mean that yet. But they wanted some sort of different order for Jews. An mm -hmm. order that would recognize that this part of the world belongs to Jews. Maybe not exclusively, but also. Yeah. That, that's also a questionable thing because uh, we both know that uh, Jews are a very heterogeneous group, religiously, historically, linguistically, socially, racially. But uh, we can discuss that sure. in another topic because uh, sure. Sure. we have so many. Yeah, we have so much. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Uh, so, what's, 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 so. What does what what does Jabotinsky do in this famous article from 1923, in which he uses a settler colonial analysis? Right. What you do in every analysis, you compare. You compare cases, and when you compare cases, you assume that there's a difference between them. Right? No one is arguing for an exact identity between the Israel-Palestine case and North America or Latin America or Australia and New Zealand. No one's saying it's the exact same thing, but it's comparable. And if it's comparable in one area, you have people coming from the outside and building a new uh, order, maybe it will be comparable in other areas. Yeah. And the other area could be the native people will resist. <laughs> True. Right? As they have resisted in other cases. So but this in is North America, but of course yeah. uh, Arabs are not uh, Red Indians or Aboriginals, and this is the problem with. Uh, but, with but but yeah. again, it's not situation. saying that they are exactly the same. It's saying no, they're that, that that they're comparable. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it says here that we don't have much time. We can we can spend seven minutes, eight minutes, like in basketball, and uh, I'll send you another okay. link. Okay. So continue with also... uh, with uh, Zev Zevia Botinsky. Okay. So um, uh, the so so basically uh, Zev Jabotinsky's conclusion is that currently, since we want to control, we want to build a home in this land. And the majority population that we are encountering, right, and he called them indigenous or natives, does not. There is no way to reach uh, a, a compromise to get to consolidate our new home uh, with the consent of the uh, local population unless we appear to be invincible. His vision, in, entitled The Iron Wall, is a kind of more passive metaphor. Yeah. We will not attack them, but we will just be immovable, right? Iron Wall. But here maybe his analysis is a bit naive. There's no such thing as a pure defensive ethos or a purely defensive uh, uh, military as strategy, right? So we need to be strong. And only once the Palestinians, the Palestinian Arabs, realize that we can move away, then they'll start compromising with us. And th that will be the time to start compromising with them. And if you read the text, you see, we will have, everything will be on the table. Like, even issues of, of, of I would say, from what I read between the lines, again, this is 1923, could not have imagined 1948. But you, can, but you can see that 
everything, including the the uh, um, uh, some sort of binational arrangement. How does this country contain, and how does the 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 state that will control this country contain two national entities that he was willing to recognize exists, even even when many Palestinians did not recognize. <laughs> so. Uh, that was Jabotinsky's argument. Now, um, where do you, where should I progress from here? Um, uh, so, at, so after saying that, we've I've definitively proved, right, that the, at least the way I read. Um, settler colonial analysis does not require you to suggest that Jews do not belong there, that Zionism is uh, uh, inherently evil. Right. Yeah. It's irrelevant. What I think. Yeah. I, I personally now, believe that uh, we had many combinations and many plans in 19th and 20th centuries what to do with particular European uh, Jews or European Jewry. And of course, one of the plans, which is for some reason ignored, was to create a, a Jewish state on the territory of modern Poland, Belarus, and Lithuania. Of course, that plan was shattered with the Holocaust yeah. and atrocities that were committed in, in World War II. And it became completely but keep in mind, keep in mind that the earliest forms of Zionism could yeah. not have imagined the Holocaust. Yeah, and Absolutely. they could not have imagined uh, 1948. True. And so, and so, the idea was that at the time, in the late 19th century, there hardly were any kind of sovereign states that weren't in some sort of imperial arrangement, right? Yeah. So there wasn't the, the the model of a nation state wasn't the hegemonic one to begin with. True. And and Zionism was the was a way to normalize the Jewish situation all over the world. In Europe. Where, yeah. In, uh, Europe, in because, Europe, let's say where where the, the main the main pogroms were committed in 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 Eastern Europe. Yes, but the problem the problem seemed to stem from the notion of Jews being rootlessness, having root having no roots. Yeah. Having to be the eternal odd uh, wanderer, uh, eternal wanderer and all kinds of exactly. stereotypes that people like to to, to So exploit. if they if they have their if they have a homeland, they will become a normalized people that um um, you know, again, Europe is filled with cases of populations that have moved from one place to another, naturalized, but could always refer, oh, I came from there. So Jews would have that. Jews would have, mm -hmm. I came from. Anyways, um, returning to the settler colonial theory um, or analytical framework, uh, um, it is best to kind of uh, uh, explain it by negating it to what we know as colonialism. Yeah. And here is the major problem, I think, that I, as a scholar, is trying to build a career, is trying to, to publish, um, is encountering problems because the way the 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 phrase that was chosen to explain the problem the, or to explain the type of projects Zionists did or American settlers did yeah. or, or uh, Italian settlers in Argentina did, the word that we are using suggests that it's just a type of colonialism. It's a, it's a form of colonialism. And I would say nothing could be further from the truth. And uh, I want to point out now the important differences, and I would say stark differences between colonialism and settler colonialism. And I'm going to send you the link now. Yes, send the link and 
for the con continuation of our conversation. Yes. Uh, we are continuing with uh, settler colonialism, and people probably think that uh, settler colonialism is the same concept as a regular colonialism, like uh, a British India or or British right, presence right. in in the Middle East during their mandate uh, phase. It's it's so it's it's good that you mentioned that because basically what happens is what happened with the history of the concept is that people realize it's easy to realize that Zionism or the the uh, Israel is not a simple case of colonialism. People can can easily get that, right? Yeah. And they obviously know since since it has not been um, since it has not been uh, defeated, then then e even just by that uh, there there seems to be a difference between that and regular colonies. And then suddenly, this new term came, right? And it has been used as a way to account for the different fate of Zionism while trying to keep the rest of the baggage uh the moral baggage or and the um future destiny baggage intact saying that yeah. it is as deplorable as colonialism and it is destined to vanish like colonialism but it's not exactly colonialism so let's call it settler colonialism if you ask me, this is why the term became popular to begin with. But this kind of usage of the term, which I don't mind, uh, you know, again, this is something that has to do with a political opinion. Yeah. Is this kind of usage of the term um, really fails to account for how productive this uh, para this this analytical framework can be in explaining. So what we have is uh, uh, so what we have is uh, uh, let's go on with the, uh, explaining the difference between colonialism and settler colonialism. Let's just um, uh, focus on that. So to begin with the difference can be, there's differences in two realms. The first realm would be the relationship. Sorry, let's go a few steps backward. What is this yeah, similar about colonialism and settler and colonialism? Both feature movements of people on the globe from one place to another, right? And this movement is not about uh, immigration. It's not about joining the society you're going. It's about changing the fundamental political structure of the place that you will um, that uh, that uh, uh, you will reach. That is similar, but the differences can be found in the relationship between the, the people that are leaving that place to go to that new place and where they came from, how they relate to where they came from and how they relate to the people that they encounter. In those two basic realms, there is huge difference. And you can almost say that colonialism and settler colonialism are ideal types that don't really exist in anywhere in history in their pure form. They are ideal types that are on both sides of a spectrum, completely opposite. So 
if we're looking at the colonial spectrum, the relationship between people li leaving the one part of the world and going to another part of the world in the name of a colonial project, the relationship is very tight. It's either a British soldier, a French settler, uh, a, a Dutch administrator, right? Okay. Who is leaving his home in the metropole and going to manage and occupy and exploit another land, but he's not giving away his uh, citizenship or identity as an imperial citizen. In fact, he would probably do whatever he needs to do, he or she, and then return. Home is waiting. Being part yes. of the British Empire, the French Empire, the Dutch, uh, uh, the, the Dutch state are important to their identity. In a settler colonial situation, you will find that the movement from one part of the world to another has to do with formulating an identity that is separate okay. from where you just came from. True. So uh, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of uh, North American settler colonialism, we see the notion of distinctness, right? Yeah. Rather early on from, um, from uh, the old world, right? In Zionism, you see this notion of distinctness from the very beginning, right? People yeah. that have left have left uh, uh, the Russian Empire really yeah, left it without sentiment. any feelings of uh, of uh, loyalty and mission towards the Russian uh, no, Tsar. On the contrary, they ran away from uh, Zionism. Exactly. And by the way, that is why and when Kodak. people when 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 it, it's usually coming from the Zionist side. When people say Israel cannot be settler colonial because they did not, uh, there was no metropole that they, they, then they're not realizing that this is actually put Zionism very close on the ideal type uh, um, area of settler colonialism because there wasn't even any attachment to begin with, right? Some in, in the United States, there were some British subjects of the king that Absolutely. grew a American consciousness, you know, within generations or within one generation, but this was never the case in Zionism. So the idea of not having a metropole that is sending you is actually makes you is closer to the ideal type of settler colonialism. Okay, so we've established that the a colonial movement is a is one that is carries on its back the sovereignty, the identity, the culture of where you came from. And a settler colonial movement is characterized by a distinctness. Now let's move on to the other area of difference: the relationship between the, per the person moving from one part of the world and the person they are encountering in the new part. In uh, the ideal types colonial situation, that relationship is primarily characterized by exploitation. You come to a new country, it has natural resources, but it also has people. Those people can work for you. Of course. This is what happened in India, in British India. Exactly. Marxist. They didn't exterminate the uh, Indians. Right. Those people can work for you, and they can also buy your products. You can really Absolutely. exploit these people. Yeah. Right. You need, so so what made Paris, what made London, these beautiful cities, is yeah. the harsh exploitation of uh, populations all over the world. Right. Well, now, exploitation is not good use, but it also means that there's no vested interest to make you disappear because it needs you, right? Now, 
if you're trying to, if you're not uh, 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 reaching this new land in order to extract value and send it back, right? You're actually trying to create a new home. You're sometimes literally, you're settling, right? You're trying to grab land and there's someone already on that land, right? He, he, he not only have you no need for them, because you're not interested in sending money back home, they're redundant. They're a problem. It's a it's a problematic situation. So in colonialism, the relationship between colonial and native and indigenous is that it's primarily characterized by exploitation. Of course. In settler colonialism, the relationship is characterized by elimination. This is what we had in Europe. I'm going to make a small digression. What Europe? In Eastern Europe. Ah, Eastern Europe. Yes, of course. One of the main programs of uh, Himmler and Nazis was to remove the population, physically to remove the population of Eastern Europe. And they managed to kill over 10 million people in Poland, in Belarus and Ukraine in order to settle German farmers and to flourish their imaginary right. So this, this is an example of failed settler colonialism. Of course, it doesn't have a direct uh, analogy to what we are talking about, because in history, you don't have 100% uh, analogies. I, personally, I don't believe in that. But that was a that was also an example of settler colonialism to a very extreme because his measures were super extreme. And of course, we know what repercussions befell on the whole area and uh, Germany itself. What do you think yeah, about yeah. it? Yes. Because he had, if you, if you read what he wrote, he always had uh, articles and justification how to remove, how to kill people in order to improve agriculture in, right. in Eastern Europe. So in order to improve agriculture, you have to kill 50 million people and to depopulate another 3 million people. My grandfather used to tell me the story that uh, Nazis used to plan for Serbs a complete withdrawal behind the Ural Mountain. And when I was a kid, I thought it was some kind of uh, science fiction or he exaggerated, but in fact, later on, when I started the subject, that was the plan. So they also had their own uh, racist uh, settler colonialism, which thankfully failed. However, ho however, however, I think we have an example here of a structure that doesn't fit that well with either colonialism or settler colonialism, because it's true that the Nazis were not about exploiting the populations, even though I think eventually that's what happened. It's not- They had to exploit. Yeah, but it was not about creating a new political entity, which is what settler colonialism is. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, so, I agree with so, that. No, no. So, they were just so, removing populations yeah. left and right. So True. while there is, while, while I know Hit for a fact that Hitler was inspired by the depopulation of the Americas by settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was engaged in a settler colonial, but it does mean that genocide and ethnic cleansing Absolutely. were part, yeah, yeah, are, are, part. Are, are methods that are used by different historical formations and different uh, historical entities. But settler colonialism, in as much as it has to create a new home, will find the people that already have a home there to be a problematic population. And so elimination versus exploitation, sometimes yes. these two things can, can, can overlap. If you, if you eliminate half the population, maybe half of the other half will be more, more easily exploitable because they would be submissive. Yeah, they, they right? would become slaves. Right, exactly. This so is what, that doesn't this mean- This is what Nazis uh, plan for Eastern Europe. Exactly. So that doesn't mean that these two are mutually exclusive, but at least analytically, it's distinguishable, right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
and I would say that so so uh, um, have keeping that in mind, it's a good now it's a good time to delve into what elimination means. And elimination, obviously, this is the term used by Patrick Wolf, a, a very important scholar. I owe most of my, I would say, fifty percent of the, my knowledge. The other fifty percent would be Lorenzo Veracini. Um, both are uh, trained in Australia, so um, and familiar with the Australian case. So elimination is obviously ethnic cleansing and genocide, right? You know, you have people, just push them away, either push them from out of existence or at least beyond a frontier. Simple enough. And But here's the, here is, I think, the most important part that people often neglect. Elimination also contains or can also accommodate or can also be compatible with forms of assimilation, integration, um, absorption of the native population into the settler body politic, into the settler political system, political system in, yeah. into the settler culture even, right? And yeah. of course, this absorption is not into the highest ranks, but is it is intimate. It is powerful absorption. This is not it. This qualitatively different than certain co-optations that colonial powers did with local populations and usually uh, lords, right? Mm -hmm. In which local populations were somehow um, were somehow. Uh, um, incorporated into the imperial rule, right? But in colonialism, the hierarchy of citizen of the metropole, subject of the colony is, is very important. Of course. It, it is what this exploitation is, this is, is premised on. This is the essence of uh, essence, that type of right. colonialism, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 um, important scholar of colonialism, Partha Chatterjee, says it is uh, the rule of colonial difference. That is what modern colonialism is about. I mean, there were empires before the modern era, but a colonial empire of the modern era is distinguishable in the fact that what constitutes it is the difference between the European and the native. In but for instance, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you, but for instance, in, in, in classical colonialism, we still have remnants of classical colonialism in, in countries like Chile or right. Argentina, where ruling elites are European. Or in, in case of Argentina, 90% of the population are Europeans, let's say Italian. 40% or 45%, not to go into details about uh, other communities, but indigenous population in Argentina is a tiny minority. And uh, if you go to other countries like Bolivia, where indigenous population has a higher percentage, still the, the political and economic elites are European elites. Right. Or non-indigenous of it, you right. have Arabs coming to Arabs coming to South America and Latin America, and they form relatively influential community. Right, because they came from the outside. Yeah, because they came from outside. Exactly. Yeah. So, so um, the level, so the border between European and native. Uh, you know, in, in as much as Native it's European, population, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes uh, we have uh, mainland Chinese and uh, and uh, Formosan, right? It's not necessarily yeah. European, but in most cases, it's European. Let's include Jews in the category of European. Then the difference between the European and the and the Native uh, um, is um, often uh, transcended. 
is often blurred in a settler colonial situation. Now, in the US, you will see this very prominently. I, it, one way of understanding this difference between elimination and exploitation is just look at the term Indian, right? Oh, you yeah. have two Indian populations. Cool. One in India and, and the, the other, red Indians. And the, and the, the red Indians, right? American Indians, Native Americans, right? One underwent a relationship of elimination. Many were killed. Many were absorbed into the genetic stock of uh, white Americans. Yeah. Many, if you, I'm in the U.S. right now, many whites in the U.S. often like to kind of celebrate, oh, I'm one eighth, I'm one, one twenty-eighth. One twentieth of, of yeah. the Red Indian, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, of, of uh, Indian, of Cherokee, of Navajo, yeah. no, and all that. this is also funny. Right. This a pride in some sort of indigenous ancestry is unthinkable in the colonial situation, right? That I have the blood of a subject? No, 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 no. No, I am no way, of course. Right. In the old school European racism, it would be a big taboo. No exactly. way. Exactly, exactly. Now, in India, in South Asia, there are, so how many Indians, Red Indians, Native American Indians are there and how many Indians in South Asia? Right. So one went through colonialism and was primarily um, um, was primarily uh, exploited, and the other went through settler colonial and was primarily eliminated. <laughs> so that's why we have more than a billion and a half. How many Indians are there? Exactly. Much more than a billion, and why we have only several millions uh, uh, Native is. Americans. Exactly. Or Native, Amer Native, Native Americans, yes, it's yeah. But how now, how vague is even even that term is very vague because we we're talking about different communities and different ethnicities, I, all I in their primitive forms, but still they they had their languages, they have their I I, I agree, and, th and there and there's an element of some of the language that I'm using that flattens these differences, and you know. And papers over the the different narratives, and also um, doesn't uh, is not conducive to, for instance, point out that some Indian tribes uh, um, related to the settlers almost as equals, right, as as an equal nation. That happened as well. Usually, not for the long term, but in any case. Um, so, so we can easily understand. Now let's move to Zionism, right? Once yeah. I've kind of explained settler colonialism as distinct from colonialism, it's very easy to see why Israel fits um, the settler colonial paradigm, or the settler colonial, or is closer to the settler colonial yeah. spectrum. Project. 19, 19, like the creation of the state had to do with detachment from an imperial sponsor with the British yeah. at the same time as the Zionist settlers detached from the imperial Russia. ruler. Or no, well, I, yeah. so, no, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm talking Britain. Let's say oh, okay. at, yeah, a yeah, yeah. Point, yeah. at a certain point, at a certain point, the entire Zionist project has been, uh, I wouldn't say co-opted, but uh, maybe co-opted by the British Empire, right? It was co-opted by the British Empire. Yeah, yeah. So the movement for consolidation had to do with leaving the British Empire, is detaching from the British Empire on the one hand. And on the, the other hand, what happened in 1948 is the 80% elimination of the indigenous population from the territory upon which Israel was created, right? So those 700,000 refugees, most of them reaching Jordan, um, but also other parts of the Middle East, um, they were eliminated. You know, it fits, it fits the contours of the analytical framework, right? Of course. 
But then one has to ask now, what did Israel do with the rest, with the remaining Palestinian Arabs within its territories, right? Which at the time was about 10% of the Jewish population. 15%, it went down to 10% because all the settlers slash immigrants slash refugees came from the Middle East. So suddenly yeah. there were much more, many more Jews with Arab culture, but many more Absolutely. Jews. Absolutely, no, no, they're genuine Jews. If you're yeah. talking about Mizrahi Jews, of yeah. course they're part, they're part of the Middle Eastern uh, ethnic but fabric and cultural it, fabric. Uh, but in my opinion, the cultural identity, the, 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 all this, once you come from the outside, that's what matters. Okay, but uh, you, you can compare a Baghdadi Jew with uh, an Ashkenaz from Lithuania. I can. I, in, fact, of in fact, I can they're, they're compare. They're more similar because, to this culture. Because I'm, not, because I'm not that interested myself in what is the uh, makeup of their breakfast, right? I am more interested in what is the political status of the person entering Palestine. And it's that of a fully fledged member of the settler community. Okay. Oh, so the, that's why, yeah. so, so and, and so, and, and, and in every case, a later arriving community is never incorporated into the top echelons of the system. Probably not. But uh, for instance, I personally believe that uh, Arab states, Muslim states, when I'm talking about uh, these events, I'm referring to Iran, made a mistake by expelling the uh, Jewish community to Israel. These communities lived in, in uh, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Yemen. Morocco for thousands it, of years. It, it, in as much as in as much as you find the Zionist project uh, to be um, problematic, that is definitely correct. Yeah, it was not a smart move. No, it wasn't <laughs> a smart move. If, if, it was if I were them, move. I would keep them within the Arab states, and I would I would treat them as equal citizens because they they are equal citizens, and their mother tongue was Arabic. Yes, and yet all these things can change in in uh, in a um, blink of an eye. They can just change. And now, I wish I'm, I wish and now if you take all this, about that. and now to be frank with you, if you take all this uh, romantic um, uh, nostalgia for the time when Jews and Arabs lived in the Middle East uh, yeah. as brothers or cousins, yeah. right? And I'm not you denying that be. that was a reality. Now, if you uh, if if you'd ask me, the Mizrahi Jews are are much more known as for their militancy, their anti-Arab oh, yeah. sentiments, oh, yeah. and of so course. and so all of these all of these uh, they became radicalized. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but all of these cultural uh, uh, affinities are uh, very easily overridden. By uh, by uh, historical by po by policies of of uh, no, no, by, by ideology uh, and, nation uh, states. And, and and different political concepts, of course. Yeah, exactly. So in because, any case, yeah, go ahead. But let's I return. Let's refer. return to, for instance, in in, uh, in in Zaris, Germany, Ashkenaz were very respected and they were relatively integrated into society. I would say they were very well integrated into society, and even during World War One, they they had uh, all kinds of uh, rights that were performed for them within the German army. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And suddenly, and suddenly, it switched in in ten or five years. Yeah. So yes, you're right that things can switch quickly in in a nick of second, not in five years. Right. I agree with you. So, so Israel post 48 still had around 160,000 Palestinians living in the living in their territory. These are Palestinians, some of them evaded the Nakba, some of them 
experienced the Nakba, but remained within the borders, internally displaced. Mahmoud Darwish oh, good. Uh, is an example of that. Um, and others uh, returned. More. Yeah. We're talking 20,000 people. Considering the total population of Palestinians at the time, that's quite a, quite a few people that managed to return. And so Israel still had an indigenous problem. And it catered to that problem like in a, in a, in a fashion that is consistent with settler colonialism, not, not of colonialism. How? It granted them gradually citizenship. Of course. We're and, talking about so-called Arab Israelis. And in fact, they or, are... Yeah, let's say Arab 48. 48 Arab. Arab. Arab 48, yes. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, this is hard to, um, to grasp from 2023. Because in, because in 2023, if you look back at 1948, you will also notice that they were placed under military rule. Hukum al askari Yes. Called the military government. Um, many people, even those interested in Israel-Palestine, do not know that that population between 48 and 1966 was placed under military rule, martial law. Of course. And the fact that December 1966, this martial law is canceled, and then in June 1967, seven months afterwards, even less, I would say, it was six months and a few days afterwards, there's a new military rule, but this time it's over. It's over what population? The the Palestinians in the territories. So, Sab, are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you, and and we're going to talk about integration of the Arab population between right. 1948 and uh, 1967, because this is one of your scholarly papers. Yes, so checking this, your... is, this is my actually, my dissertation is about right. that. We can talk about that. Okay, so, so I thought that since Israel held under, held throughout its existence, military rule over Palestinian Arabs, only forfeiting that military rule for six months, I thought that this was essential to what Zionism is, right? Okay, yeah. And that's how I approached this military government. But when I approached, but when I went to the archives, when I looked at the daily newspapers, when I interviewed Arabs and military governors and everyone there, you, I could not uh, uh, sweep under the rug the fact that that particular first military government progressively dissipated between 48 and 66. Good. Very different from the military government that was created in 67 and exists still today. Yeah. That military government disappeared. And so you can say that the military government during 48 and 66 was not really a good tactic for settler colonialism. Its dismantlement was the settler colonial policy. That is that is uh, uh, something I argued in the in my dissertation. That giving citizenship was one thing. That was the mm -hmm. momentary decision and yeah. had to do a lot with international law and, and being sure. accepted to the UN. But Getting rid of the military government, which is by 1966 is the Zionist consensus. This is not a hugely controversial topic. Begging is against it. And of course the left is against it. And of course the Arabs are against it. Yeah. And it just, 
disappears, not without any, no prime minister was assassinated at that in time, the yeah. attempt to do that, yeah. right? And so my realization is that Israel between 48 and 66, what happens is um, um, made more visible, more transparent, not less transparent. It is made more understandable if you understand settler colonialism. Yeah. It's not as if Israel in 1966 was post-Zionist. It's not as if Israel if Zionists are inherently democratic and liberal people, right? It's because. Israel and other settler colonial nations have found that the integration of a Palestinian or uh, of a native population, uh, population is a very a good way, is in a, is in is in a very is a, an efficient way yeah. to deal with threats that might arise mm -hmm. from that population. And let's give credit to the early Israelis. There was a threat from the Palestinian Arabs. They adored Nasser. They oh, had organic, sometimes fam and familial ties with Israel's enemies outside the borders. Of course, not, not, the, not, all of them. The Israeli leadership, the Israeli leadership, was aware of all these things. Was aware for the sympathy towards uh, pan Arabism. Was aware sure. of the feeling. Of, even, even even that term pan Arabism sounds uh, awkward, because Arabs are a single nation, and if you so say Arabism, exactly Arabism is more 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 accurate. We have yeah. to kill. We have to kill all these uh, old-fashioned and inaccurate uh, terms in in sociology and historical science because they they suffocate us. <laughs> even if you say. Not only pan Arabism, but uh, some other terms which are not accurate. So you're gonna. So at this at this point, yeah, uh, you'll send, send me the link. link. Of course. Okay. Talk to you in to a few minutes. In in, uh, in eight minutes, yes. Now I'm starting. Yeah. So where were we? We we were talking about. Uh, about uh, colonial difference between colonial uh, right, and so in nineteen so colonialism, classical colonialism so is, and Israel in, colonialism. Israel in, yeah. Yeah. yeah so Israel in nineteen forty eight and the decades following it really um, uh, approximated an ideal type settler colonial yeah. state. Um, it got rid of the majority of the native population by force. And those that remained were incorporated very slowly, not completely on equal terms, but they were incorporated. And I think that by 1967, the term Arab-Israeli was used for self-identification. Arabs in Israel felt like they were Arab Israeli. And some still do, till today. Then we all know June 1967 war happens. The war was, of course, the animosity between Israel and uh, the Arab states was structural. It, it didn't happen out of the blue. But the main causes were very much contingent. Yeah, the Soviets were uh, were uh, uh, scheming, and uh, we, in hindsight, know that Nasser took a gamble. He thought that Israel will not attack, and it did. And it did attack. Israel was very reluctant to enter this war. It was not confident that it would win such a huge victory. So it's wrong to say that it was um, destiny. It was inevitable. Mm -hmm. And yet it happened. And once it happened, Israel ended up controlling a much larger territory that had a much larger indigenous or Palestinian Arab 
population. And then Israel was faced with a dilemma, what to do with this population. Once the dust settled, it was obvious that elimination, transfer, ethnic cleansing was not in the cards. I'm not saying people didn't wish for it to happen, but it wasn't there. And and frankly, there wasn't a high motivation for that. But there were two visions that were offered. One of them is by someone who, because of your uh, interest in archaeology, I'm sure you know on many levels, Moshe Dayan. Yeah, of course. He has a big... Uh... Oh, I mean, he had the big collection of uh, archaeological artifacts. Right. And he was passionate about uh, archaeology. Really? And, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, he had uh, a popular belief in ex Yugoslavia that he came from Sarajevo, but originally he came from uh, Eastern Europe, from uh, Ukraine. I see. So Moshe Dayan, who was at the time next to God, in Israeli politics yeah. and culture even. Um, he was really the chief strategist of uh, the Israeli Labor Party. Yeah. And, I, uh, and I've read a book that he, he writes, he, that he really pontificates. He, he invests a lot of time thinking, what shall we do with these territories and the people inside of them? And he comes up with an idea of controlling the territory, settling the territory, not granting citizenship to the Palestinians living in that territory, but conducting a rule that is benevolent, that is hands-off, that is not intrusive. And I think he was sincere in his intentions. Because if you like if you, if you read the book that he wrote it's a basically a collection of articles that's called New Map New Relationship. So there's a new Israeli map and there's a new relationship with the Arabs. Suddenly there's a there's a new Arab population that Israel needs to determine how will it relate to it. And you could genuinely discern that he says, for instance, we should not, um, we should not censor newspapers. We should not uh, be very intrusive with the curriculum. We should not have military presence in the Palestinians' daily lives. He's imagining a very distant, hands-off rule over the Palestinians. And if you, if, and if you want to be generous with him, he, has, he might have what we can call good intentions. Yeah. But there was yeah, an that, alternative that, to... There was an alternative to Moshe Dayan's um, uh, vision. That was Menachem Begin's vision of the territory. Now, obviously, he's from the right. He also believed Israel should control these territories. He also believed Israel should settle these territories. But he thought that the state has to grant the Palestinians in these territories' citizenship. This is not some sort of uh, um, archive document that I managed to find because I'm a I'm a talented historian. This is in the 1969 platform of Begin's party, which would later be the Likud. Yeah, it is written there that the possibility of citizenship needs to be given to anyone. Annexation and citizenship. So we have Dayan, Dayan's approach, which is control 
without citizenship and without intervention into the daily lives. Mm -hmm. And we have Begin, who says control citizenship, and in a way, citizenship, being part of the state, is the most intrusive yeah. policy into people's lives. The Labor Party with Dayan got 56 seats in the Knesset. Begin got 26 seats. Israelis chose control, settlement, and no citizenship. That's what mm -hmm. they chose. Yeah. Gradually, what we see happening in the relationship between the territories and its population and Israel is a relationship that resembles more and more a colonial relationship, not a settler colonial. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, and Dayan points out, Dayan says we need to give them jobs, right? Very quickly, the people in the territories become incorporated into Israel, but not as equal citizens, as cheap labor. They become part of the economy. Their, their markets are flooded with Israeli industry. Sounds familiar? Of course. Right. And, the, and as we know, with every colonial relationship, in that, in, in, in as much as we understand uh, a modern variation of colonialism, which is premised on difference and exploitation, we see what happens every time. Within 20 years, the Palestinian Arab pop the Palestinian population of the territories, which was relatively passive when compared to other Palestinian communities around the Middle East, becomes the center of the Palestinian national movement. Colonialism is one of the best means, most efficient means in creating an antagonistic national movement against an occupier. It's, it's tried and uh, 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 it's, it's tried and true in uh, 200 years of history of colonialism. You have the Algerians in the in the uh, uh, 19th century, and you have the Algerians in the middle 20th century. Uh, an, a, a nation that rises up against an empire versus various tribes and and uh, yeah. and different ethnicities. So Israel was so the type of regime that Israel chose in 1967. And alternatives were on the table. Begin's alternative was there. That type of regime is a much more colonial regime. And so here we have, within Zionist history, Zionism essentially being closer to the settler colonial model. Within its own history, you have a colonial instance. You have an interplay between these yeah. two instances. These are, again, it's not an ideal type. Of course. Now, what is very interesting is that Israel starts to settle that territory, right? But think about the settlers in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. What is their relationship to Israel? What is their relationship to the place they are le leaving? Yeah. Is it antagonism? Are they running away as refugees from Israel? Or is Israel sending them there? Or do they see their, their mission to extend Israel's borders? Right? I think they, yeah, I think it's a combination of many factors, but probably the the former one uh, yes. is the, the major motive because right. they, they have a messianic uh, idea of expanding uh, 
Israel to Judea and Samaria and further. They can come to, 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 to my the, area. The, the Messianic ideas, e, the, you know, in the margins of the settler yeah. movements, there is a Messianic movement that really sees Israel as, as, as a problem. It's a secular state. True. Right? So those, I would say, that very kind of radical uh, uh, minority, those are settler colonial. Yeah. But the mainstream settlers, many of them are not even religious. Of course. Many of them, many of them are Russian immigrants that are that grew up in atheist uh, uh, environment. Environment, yes. Yeah, they are just we're citizens, and this is another place for me to settle. And I am an Israeli citizen, and I'm doing this as a service to Israel. And so there's a complete identity, right? So. The fact that there are settlers in the West Bank does not mean that the colonization of the West Bank is a type of settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. In fact, these settlers should be, this is Lorenzo Veracini's um, way of phrasing it, they should be considered colonial settlers rather than settler colonial. Mm -hmm. And all of this just complicates. Already just complicated compl situation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, believe me, if it was up to me, I would not call it settler colonialism mm -hmm. because it it uh, 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 obstructs uh, a clear understanding rather than contributes to. I would call it settlerism, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact because they, they do actually they do fight building by building, hill by hill. Village by village, territory by territory, and probably those uh, Kahanis think that they can clean, cleanse the territory left and right for next 200, 300 years from yeah. current day borders all the way to East Bank and further. Yeah, if they manage but, to fulfill their dream. But, but sad. So, yeah, in as much as there, there's continuities between post sixty seven and pre sixty seven oh, yeah. Zionism. There's continuities. But what settler colonialism as an analytical framework that's distinct from colonialism helps us is to look at the differences between before sixty seven and after sixty seven. And for some people, Zionists or right-wing Zionists and Palestinians, the notion that there's a difference is not something that they're politically comfortable with. Anti-Zionists would like to say that Israel has always been awful. Nothing really changed. Pro-Zionist uh, commentators like to think that Israel has always been wonderful. Nothing really changed. But this set of analytical tools allows us to point out at a difference. Not saying that it, that colo settler colonialism is good or that colonialism is bad. I'm not saying that colonialism is good and settler colonialism is bad. I'm not, these are not even terms that are worth using. I'm saying that they're distinct. And one has to ask themselves a question. Where on earth do we have a approximately ideal type form of colonialism today? All over the world. It's only one place. The West Indeed. Bank and... Uh, no, the West Bank. Okay. Even... I'm not saying that this is the worst humanitarian case in the world, and, you know... One can argue that it is, but I'm not saying that. It's not the case of political oppression or anything like that. But the oppression of the Uyghurs, for instance, for instance, in China, or the Tibetans in China, yeah, or the Ukrainians in occupied um, Crimea, right? Of course, is prep is Which premise. Is a bit, it's a bit different question and different. Uh, no, but but. Whatever is happening there, right, the subjects of 
oppression are considered citizens of that state, True. members of that nation. Yeah, they're second class citizens, in fact. If they, if, if they don't consider themselves as Russians, they, they definitely cannot identify themselves uh, with, with the new regime and with uh, Putin's True, regime. But the new Russia. regime, but the new regime propagates a, a, um, a, a world view that they are Russian citizens. Oh, and yeah. they are, yeah. Of and, and Israel does not propagate that with the Palestinians. No, this is different. Different case. Exactly. You cannot compare so, so, situation in Ukraine with situation uh, in 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 Iran. So, what we have to understand when 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 we have this kind of tool of settler colonialism and colonialism as distinct, mm -hmm. we can still argue that Israel has a vested interest to eliminate the Palestinians. And well, as much as uh, and as much as. Uh, um, uh, you know, it, it, it is an explosive topic, the idea, if there's a genocide happening now in Gaza, are there intentions of genocide? You cannot deny the fact that there are top Israeli leaders who are advocating for it. Of course. People that sit in the decision-making table. You cannot deny that there is a, a genocide or at least ethnic cleansing sentiment. You cannot deny that. And so, settler, so, so we're still in the settler colonial paradigm in general where one way for Israel for the for one way for Israelis to solve the problem that they have is to just let's eliminate the Palestinians altogether that huh. continues but one has to ask did what the Israelis do between 1967 and 2023 did that lead Israel to that position? And it did not. Of course. It did not decrease the number of Palestinians, and it did not make Palestinians more amenable to Zionism. It did the opposite. So while Israel might have always had settler colonial intentions, after 67, it is employing colonial methods that will not achieve a settler colonial objective and and so it allows us this is this is a language that allows us to parse what happened to allows us to identify decisions that were made in real time and not explain why things happened because this is how zionists are or this is how palestinians are of course and it also helps us, for instance, to look at other, in, to, to, to really understand deeply what is the vested interest in certain policies, like two states. This is very pragmatic know. solution, yeah. Two state solution is, uh, let's say, pragmatic solution. But what is the two state solution? In the language that I'm pointing out, yeah. it would mean the withdrawal of Israel or the decolonization of the territories. True. But it would also mean the consolidation of the settler colonial project within 67. Mm -hmm. Because you will eliminate 5 million Palestinians, not by killing them. No. Not by transferring them. Not by absorbing them but by redrawing your own borders to keep them outside. Of course. So you see how these terms really allow us to understand um, certain Zionist visions uh, in, in, with, with the language of interest, not kind, being kind, being uh, 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 pragmatic, ruthless, yeah. but... Uh, Pragmatic, yes, but understanding why there would there is still a large number of Zionists, and including the one you're talking to, who believes, who who advocates for a two state solution, because it is obviously because I see it in in my best interest. Yeah. It is a way for my state 
to consolidate, to to um, lessen maybe to survive. the problem. Maybe to survive, because now we have a 50-50 population between uh, Red Sea and Mediterranean. No, not Red Sea, Ma True. Red Sea and Mediterranean. We're but talking then, about uh, Saib, Arab population and Sato population. But Saib, hmm. keep in mind, there are other options. Like a binational state. Yeah. And what would a binational solution mean? First of all, those I, I personally I personally support binational solution. Excellent. I support one one state solution. Okay, excellent, Saib. So if you support one state, yeah, then you then what you actually are supporting is that the settler and the indigenous share a state, right? Okay. Have Equal political rights. Fine. And recognize each other. Absolutely. Right? As belonging to the land. Okay. So what you are actually doing is eliminating the indigenous problems. No more indigenous no, problems. No, no, no. Not, you are not getting, you, this will not, you're not advocating for killing Palestinians. No. You're not advocating for killing Zionists. No, right? I'm not going to throw them into the sea. Right, but what you are advocating is to make the indigeneity of the Palestinians um, um, superfluous. Okay. You're saying it doesn't matter that they were there first. They need to share the land with the Jews. Okay. That's, so, so what that's I'm a compromise. Saying, what, what I'm you have saying, to compromise. Yes, but it's very productive to point out that your solution is a settler colonial solution. It is a settler colonial solution because exactly. I'm and not that planning, leads us I'm not and that leads to, us to what I started. Yeah. You exactly. if if you are calling Zionism a settler colonial movement. It is a settler colonial project. Fine. Then then it, then to solve then 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 one state is the consolidation of settler colonial. Of course, right. This is what Shlomo yeah. San said in uh, in his articles and his public uh, talks. Who? Shlomo San. Ah, uh, yeah. Maybe you don't I, like Shlomo, him because... I know Shlomo very well. He was my okay. teacher at uh, Tel Aviv University. Okay, you guys know each other from university. Yeah, and I and I have nothing but appreciation for him. Um. Uh. But actually, I, I agree with his uh, ideas about uh, binational. Yeah, and origin of people who came from Europe. I buy that. I support that. I mean, I, what, I'm not going to support that, anything because those, I don't have political but, power, but but I agree with that. And at the same time, I don't think that you can ship people left and right. This is why I said in the beginning of our conversation that people who live in Palestine as settlers from Europe, let's say, in second or third generation are also Palestinians. You cannot put them back to the pale settlement because pale settlement doesn't exist anymore. And so but, many but, things happened there. But here, here is what I think that settler colonialism, the way I phrased it in mm -hmm. distinction from colonialism, that could help perhaps Palestinians. I, I, I don't want to, uh, I'm not a Palestinian, I'm an Israeli, and I consider myself okay. Zionist and Jewish, so I don't want to suggest that I know what's best for them. Of course. But, um, putting, under, uh, uh, putting Israel in a, in, as a colonial entity, and that means calling Israel colonialism or calling it settler colonialism, but not understanding how different that is from colonialism, right? Of course. Has blinded Palestinians to the fact that Israelis do not see that they have anywhere else to return. The Pied Noir in Algeria, their entire identity was premised on the fact that they are from France and they can return to France, that they are French citizens. But the Israelis, the Israeli Jews, they're not PNR. So it's fine. It's fine if you like 
not fine, right? But I'm not arguing that um, wanting to decolonize the entirety of Palestine is good, it's bad, it's immoral, moral, forget about that. But it will not be like Algeria. And I no. think no, that different. if 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 the if if you want a rigorous historical explanation, not a value judgment on Palestinian nationalism or Palestinians, but a rigorous historical explanation for why the Palestinian revolution has failed, right? Okay. It has to do because it has not understood that it was facing settler colonialism in the main, right? Yeah, are you talking and about uh, are you talking about the 1930s and 1940s? And and 2023. Of course. Uh, of course. You know, the notion no, no, the, 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 I I agree and, with you. First of all, I told you from the beginning that they're not uh, separated from other Arabs. They're part of uh, a bigger community and bigger religious and uh, cultural uh, entity. And uh, it's wrong to limit them only to that part of uh, Southern Levant. Also, Arab leaders from Palestine bet on their own course, namely uh, Mufti Husseini, who didn't understand what's going on. And he was much more uh, short-sighted than the Hashemites, for instance. You probably studied the relations between Husseini and Hashemites. Hashemites understood that uh, European uh, settlers didn't come to live after two weeks or, or, or five years, while Husseini was also concerned with his uh, class position, and he was afraid that uh, creation of Israel will challenge his uh, role as a dignitary that was given to, to his clan by Ottomans. And of course, I wouldn't call him a Nazi. He wasn't a Nazi in ideological sense of the world. He was a collaborator and war criminal because he managed to mobilize uh, European Muslims into SS. Yeah. yeah. Also, his political short sightedness oh. is shown by uh, mobilization of uh, Balkan Muslims into SS in November 1943 when war was decided. So they were fighting from 1943, late 1943, until April, May 19, 1945, for completely lost cause. They, they, they didn't have any perspective of winning by, by aligning themselves with uh, Nazis. And also regarding Zionism, he didn't have uh, the best perception. That's my opinion, of course. Lots of, yeah. uh, lots of uh, Arab Muslims would disagree with me and say that he was a great uh, national leader. I, th I think he, he made a disfavor to Arab cause. One thing, one thing. If you look at the Palestinian cause, um, for instance, throughout the years of the conflict, I think, I think that the one time that um, that uh, Palestinians managed to force Israel's hand was during the first Intifada, 1988. Yeah, and that's because there was something about that struggle that originated in the territories, not outside the territories, and that was based on popular, some nonviolent tactics, some uh, um, um, kind of violent, but throwing stones and Molotov cocktails, not buses exploding. So there was something about that struggle which convinced the world and convinced quite a few Israelis 
that right here we have an anti-colonial struggle. Get out of the territories. Decolonize the territories. Yeah. I don't think anyone could think about the Palestinians in, the Palestinians managing to throw us into the sea with stones and Molotov cocktails. No, of course. It's not realistic. So the, the so and and the objectives of the first intifada were the creation of an a, a, a independent Palestinian state. They were not about uh, Going, destroying uh, Zionists to right, exactly. to Mediterranean. Um so so in as much as the Palestinian struggle manages to convince Israelis, the world, themselves that this is that that there are limited anti-colonial objectives, then there's a lot of potency. Okay. If the if if the entirety of Israel is considered Colonial, it's but you really mean colonial, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you are, um, then you should not be surprised of what's happening right now in Gaza. I think now we can finish our conversation for the first time. <laughs> I'm going to talk with you for another 10 or, or 15 or more times. <laughs> this is just initial talk. And uh, I believe that the solution for the problem is de-escalation and de-radicalization de between uh, settlers and uh, indigenous population. They have to come to common sense and uh, all, all radical... <laughs> All, all maximalist think... concepts are uh, counterproductive. And as we said, we have two solutions, one state solution, two state solutions, or maximalist solutions that include uh, throwing uh, settlers. The Jews in. or the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And this is uh, the, worst, the worst case scenario. But we can, we can agree that, that the maximalist solutions, I don't know, if there are no Jews in Palestine, maybe that works. That will be the end of violence in uh, Palestine. If there are no Palestinians in Palestine, maybe yeah. that works. Those are not good solutions, but they might be solutions. But if we look at colonialism and settler colonialism, we can understand that colonialism, and basically this was the Israeli agenda up until 20, you know, October 2023, yeah. Let's keep the Palestinians under our, in the West Bank under our control. Let's keep the Gazans under our control using Hamas, right? Mm -hmm. And let's keep that situation going on forever. History has proven that a colonial situation is just never a stable one. So, so um, all of us should be thinking about settler colonial solutions. And I hope most of us will look at settler colonial solutions that equalize the political status of Jews and Palestinians between the river and the sea. Sounds good? Sounds very good. <laughs> and we should... We're going to yes. continue talking. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Excellent. Uh, very, very productive um, guiding questions and and uh, and comparisons with other cases in the world. Really, thank you so uh, much. Pleasure. I'm going to come with more more questions and more comparison in, in, in coming talks. I wish you all the best. Okay. And send we'll me an email once it's online. I'll send you. I'll, I'll send you the. I'll push it. Yeah. I'll send. Okay. Which email did you did you want? I'm going to send you the the. The podcast, yeah. Once it's all. Uh, send it to the to the when. Tell me when it's uh, on. The, t tell me. It's, uh, you're going to put it on. Uh, yeah. It's gonna be on going to be on YouTube, right? No, no. I'm going to upload this on the YouTube. Yeah. So send me the link to the YouTube. I and will. I will. Send, I, will. I will. Okay. It's going to to be finished to in two hours. I, I don't like to, to waste time and normally. Excellent. Excellent. I, I, thought, I, I don't think we like are... to edit. Uh, my guess. Okay. I think we had a great talk.
Thank you so much. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.